Hi, everyone. If you're just joining, uh, we're going to take a few minutes to let a few more uh, attendees roll in. So sit tight. Uh, we're glad you're here. We're looking forward to a really good webinar with a couple of great panelists. Uh, so again, sit tight. We've got about 30 or 40 people here. We're going to wait till we get up to about 60 and then we will get going. All right, and while we're waiting for a few more people, I actually want to throw a poll out there to everyone. We just want to see who's joined us today. So it'll pop up on your screen there. Go ahead and throw your vote in. Uh, what's your role? Are you a market manager, market vendor? Are you a little bit of both? Because I know those exist as well. Um, or other? Throw in the chat if you fall in that other category. Who are you? What do you do? Um, we'd love to hear it. Also, while we're waiting, I'll just draw your attention to the Q&A section on your screen. That's how we're gonna be administering our Ask Me Anything or AMA section of today's webinar. So if you already have a burning question, pop it in there. Um, we can see it and uh, we'll be addressing that as soon as we get to the Q&A, which is coming up quickly. Uh, we'll start off with a couple of agenda items and then we will, uh, we will start that. So we're actually at about 52, 53 people. So we can go ahead and get going. I'm going to leave that poll on your screen for a little bit longer. Uh, but I'm Katie. I work at Local Line, and I'm going to be our host for today. And I'm joined by three fantastic panelists today, Reza, Jen, and Stephanie, all with different roles uh, and different perspectives for our Q&A section today. So we've got, let's see, 27% market managers, 30% market vendors. Pretty even across the board, 27% both, and uh, nine of you are other. So I'd love to see uh, what your roles are in the chat there. All right. So welcome to our webinar today. And I do have a few agenda items here for us. That's me holding a cup of coffee. We already talked about that. I'm Katie. I work for Local Line on the marketing team. On our agenda today, we'll do some introductions and reminders. We'll jump into some Q&A to our AMA portion, and then we'll have some concluding thoughts at the end. Pretty straightforward agenda for today's webinar. We're hoping to really uh, dive into some interesting topics about digitization for farmers markets, about selling online, uh, potentially having to navigate both selling online and having an online presence, as well as having an in-person market. Uh, last year was definitely interesting for everybody, I think, and uh, this year is gonna pose a new challenge. So excited for some insights today. So our introductions, I'm actually gonna just allow our panel today to go ahead and introduce themselves. So on my screen here, it goes Reza, Jen, and then Stephanie. So kind of feel free to say a few things about who you are, what you do, and where you're from. Does that mean you want me to start, Katie? Hey, yeah, if you could go first, that'd be great. Sure. <laughs> Uh, my name is Reza Jalal. I am the market manager and program director for the Adams County Farmers Market Association. Uh, we are based in historic Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Um, and yeah, we started losing, using local line last year uh, and we intend to keep it going and, and keep growing our, our use of the platform uh, this year. Awesome, thanks Reza. Jen, you're up next. Yeah, so for those that don't know me, my name is Jen Deneau. I actually am part of the customer success team here at Local Line. So typically, if you reach out to support uh, or customer success in general, I'm one of those faces and one of those voices that you'll likely hear if I'm on the phone with you or emailing. So it's really cool to see a ton of participants um, that I'm recognizing. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Stephanie Haynes. Um, I'm the Partnerships and Programs Manager at the Vancouver Farmers Market in Vancouver, Washington, USA. Um, and just to give you guys like a, a 
just like an idea of our market. Um, our physical market is like pretty large. Um, we're open Saturdays and Sundays, about 200 vendors. Um, and in spring 2020, during COVID, um, we started using um, local line for our online market and curbside pickup program. Um, and that means that um, our staff and volunteers were aggregating, um, packing and delivering um, orders to, to people's vehicles. Um, and we did that in tandem with our uh, physical market. Amazing. So some varied perspectives here today uh, and looking forward to that chat. But before we get going, I do have some reminders for our audience today. Uh, you will be sent the recordings. Don't worry if you missed something or if you want to go back or share this with someone else afterwards, you will be getting that email to you tomorrow in our follow-up email. So look out for that. Um, and well, this is today's webinar on April 21st at 1 p.m. And also, like I said, use the Q&A function on your screen. So pop your questions in there. Uh, we do have a couple of questions already coming through. So that's great. Thanks so much. And uh, I think next we're going to head to our Q&A. So we're going to dive right into it. Um, and I already have a couple of questions here. So I'm going to throw these out to the panel. Uh, just first off, love to hear a little bit more about how your market, so your hubs transitioned to selling online and what catalyzed that decision? What made you make the shift? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, so um, our market was set to open for the season, uh, March, 2020. Um, we were actually shut down um, for six weeks by our city, um, but we kind of fought tooth and nail um, to reopen in a really safe way. Um, but we knew when we reopened um, because of some restrictions that were, were put on us by the city um, that we were going to need to serve our customer base um, in more than one way. Um, so we decided that, um, you know, to create the most safe way to shop. Um, so having the online local line market with a curbside pickup um, option, we're, we're lucky enough. And I know a lot of markets um, probably on this call and across, you know, Canada and the U.S. aren't lucky enough to have a physical office space. Um, right next to their market, but we are so lucky to have that. So we were able to get a couple of community grants at the time and build out like a little kitchen space to pack um, and aggregate products for customer orders. Um, and yeah, we just felt like we really needed to be able to um, open an additional sales channels for vendors. Um, and at the same time, um, offer customers like the shape, the safest way to shop. Um, so that's kind of where we got started with the online market. Yeah, and I would say uh, uh, the situation for the Adams County farmers market was similar, but but not exactly analogous to what Steph Stephanie described. Um, for us, I'm not sure if this was the case in Washington State, but Farmers markets in Pennsylvania were determined early on to be essential. So we were allowed to operate. There was never a risk of being closed unless the market itself voluntarily decided to close. But what we were experiencing was a lot of customers early on, right before we launched our season, were expressing to us that they would not be willing to shop in person or that they would really prefer a reduced contact shopping option. And so in that situation, in that case, our situation was not necessarily unique. We, just like many markets, uh, want, scrambled kind of to figure out how do we accommodate the customers who would like a safer option. And we found Local Line and we launched uh, Local Line, our e-commerce platform for uh, pickups at the market um, right before the season started. And it ended up being uh, a really big success and customers not only used it, but they appreciated the, our, our mindfulness to, to their concerns and to their safety. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that is where a lot of markets saw uh, the pivot happen was in response to COVID and going forward, um, a great tool to be able to allow customers to order ahead of time. So I guess looking into the next season where things are going to hopefully be improving a little bit more for in-person farmers markets, what's the plan for both of you? Uh, keeping online, going back to in-person, are you encouraging people to order ahead of time? Yeah, what, what's the story there? Well, I, I would jump in and say, yeah, so COVID prompted us to innovate. We didn't have any intention of adopting the e-commerce platform before COVID, but now having used it, uh, it the, the benefits uh, are, are, so, are so manifest, are so uh, like clear, uh, even in a post-pandemic world, uh, I think that there are a lot of advantages to farmers markets to using a platform like Local Line. Uh, for us, what we noticed, there, there are certainly still customers who would like a, a safer option, but there are also benefits in regards to convenience um, and efficiency. And vendors also like Local Line because they can see what's selling even before the, the market opens on, on the day that it opens on Saturday morning for us. Um, so I think that going forward, what we want to do with local line is appeal to the customers who value the convenience, uh, in addition to, or maybe not as a, more than the safety aspect of it. Yeah, for sure. Stephanie, anything to add there? Yeah. Um, so we definitely started our messaging with our online market, um, in 2020 as like, the safest way to shop. Um, and now we're having, we already, um, we've already opened for the season. We opened back up in March um, and we've had some really nice weather. Um, so we've, and we're still limiting capacity in our market um, to create a safe um, in-person shopping environment. But um, because of this, we have at times a line an hour long to get into the market. Um, it's not like that on rainy days, um, but you know, on some sunny days, um, we've had some really long lines. So we're pivoting um, our online market as um, a convenience, definitely like skip the line, shop online. Um, and if, you know, short on time, all the rhymes. Um, <laughs> so really just giving people that, um, that just another option, a different way to shop the market, um, especially going into the summer season, we're anticipating limiting capacity um, probably for, you know, quite a few more months or the whole season. So it really gives people um, just another option. And we did a survey at the end of last season, um, just to our all of our online shoppers, um, just to kind of see like what they liked about it. Um, and a lot of people said um, that it was this, a safer way to shop during COVID, but a lot of people just said they really liked being able to look at products online, read the descriptions, think a lot about what they were buying, um, read about the farmers, um, because they're like some comments, um, some feedback that we got was that in the moment, they don't necessarily know what to buy. And they feel like a lot of pressure to like choose something in the moment with a line behind them at the at the farmer's booth. So they really liked being able to take more time and shop online. So, you know, I feel like um, we would have probably not done this for many years or never done it. Um, similar um, to, to what you said before, um, if it wasn't for COVID, but we're feeling like, you know, it's a useful um, part of our market now beyond COVID. Um, so yeah, we're just kind of navigating like what it, what it's going to look like this year, but also what it's going to look like, you know, in future years to come as well. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Jen, anything to add on to that from what you're seeing from all of the, the markets that you talk to on a daily basis? For sure. So um, I've been speaking to a lot more Canadian markets uh, lately, and a big part of what they're focusing on is making sure that they have curbside available because the in-person uh, shopping, especially in Ontario right now, is really just not an option because everything is so COVID focused. So where Stephanie was talking about 
her communication last year was strictly around safety. We're still in that same stance right now in the better part of Canada. So we're focusing on a lot of curbside um, pickups. So we're providing resources on providing like a curbside checklist. Also, we're seeing a lot more individuals setting up uh, just like a pre-sale booth. So instead of opening up the entire market, pretty much most of the sales are done online and then they're able to show up and pick up in person just through like a pre-order. So we're seeing a lot more of that coming through as well. I think those are really the two big things that where we can support right now. And it's also just really great to see like when things open up for those like in-person markets, like local line sees working with markets, it's a partnership. It's not one over the other. It's both of us like working together to support your communities and also just support like what the customer wants. That's really what's important at the end of the day. If there's still individuals that are concerned for safety, we'll have those options in place because of COVID for the past how many months? Sometimes it feels like it's been thousands of years at this point, but we'll have a lot of that structure in place even after uh, everything lightens up, we'll say. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, we're still kind of in the middle of it here in Canada. Yes. So, so we're going to be relying on it for a little bit longer. Um, another really great reason that just came up in the chat that I want to highlight uh, thanks, Bonnie, for throwing that in there. Uh, some customers can't always physically walk around a market to shop, but can drive up and pick up an order. And I think that's really important to note is that having an online presence, an online store is a great way to ensure accessibility for the community that you support. Um, uh, that's, yeah, great point, Bonnie. Thanks for that. Um, so I do have a few questions coming in that are really focusing on the practical side of getting your market set up getting all of your vendors on board and onboarding them. So this question might be uh, a little bit direct to Jen on the onboarding side, uh, <laughs> but I'd love to hear from Reza and Stephanie about like, how did you get your vendors on board with this? How did you get everybody set up? Uh, it can be a huge task, especially if you're relying on volunteers as well. Uh, so first I'm gonna throw this to Jen. How did you get set up or how, do, how does a market get set up? Um, on the local line platform, for, for instance, we'll use ourselves as the obvious example. Uh, and then Reza and Stephanie, I'd love to hear about uh, how you got your markets on board. For sure. Yeah. So with me, uh, pretty much when you've decided you're ready to set up your market, I'll be the first one to chime in. I'll send like an email introducing myself and providing all of the resources to set up the storefront. Um, and then we'll typically have a conversation uh, with me, the market manager, and any other uh, stakeholders that would uh, benefit from understanding what the direction is going. So when we start making a game plan for when the market gets launched, we discuss like how many vendors are going to be uh, decided on at the launch, and then what what's needed for supporting those vendors. So I take a very customized approach when it comes to onboarding vendors because what works for one market may not work for another. So for example, setting up a market, maybe we'll offer a vendor workshop, which is just a, a session with your vendors and myself. And it's a recorded session that we can go through the entire setup of what your vendors need to do in order to comply with the market policies. And then also just make sure that your storefront is set up the best way possible. So then in turn, your customers are shopping the best way. We all know that like photos make such a big deal for products. So even something as simple as that, I take care of in the onboarding process by making sure that I'm running vendor audits. And then there's all the supplemental resources that I talked about, providing like a curbside checklist and talking about um, sending articles on how to do setups because some individuals, they may not be able to join the recording or the webinar. So I take a very customized approach when getting vendors. And then I also just really lean on the market managers to communicate to the vendors that we're a partner and this is the direction that we're going. And then to help me find a game plan to make sure all of those vendors that we thought were going to come on board, they do. And then everything works out successfully. So I'm excited to see what's worked for Stephanie and what's also worked for Reza, because I think I can get some wheels turning for some future opportunities for myself too. 
Yeah. Um, so when, so we got our online, um, store up and running in, um, 2020, like within four weeks. Um, and <laughs> I will say like, um, email, um, is only so effective sometimes, <laughs> um, for market managers to connect with vendors. Um, so I made a lot of phone calls, um, and I think like there was some hesitancy from vendors. Uh, I mean, some were on board right away. Some were hesitant. And I was like, hey, like, you know, my job is to provide additional sales channels for you, whether that be at the visual market or online. I'm trying to help you make money. Um, so that has always been my messaging with vendors. Um, and even like now, um, you know, eat, so fruits and veggies are definitely like number one thing sold on our online market, but we also want to have that variety for customers, you know, eggs, meat, cheese, et cetera. Um, even like now we're doing some vendors are doing like prepared, ready to go meals, which people have loved. Um, those things don't make those vendors a ton of money. Um, but the way I kind of sell that to vendors is like, hey, you're already attending the physical market. We're going to pick these products up for you on Saturday. We're going to take it. We're going to pack it. We're going to give it to the customer. You're doing almost nothing. Um, so that's my advice for kind of selling vendors on joining the platform. Um, and then I feel like um, vendors really like appreciate that personal um, phone call. It definitely takes more time, um, but it's going to get you better um, results in terms of like how, you know, did they fill out the whole um, profile? How many products did they upload? Um, and then one other thing I did do this year, which I didn't do last year, which I think was really helpful for, for some new vendors, um, some new vendors starting on the online platform this year. So I kind of created like an information packet that I would email and then follow up with. Um, so it links to the like local line page, how to set up your supplier um, platform, which has all those great videos, how to use advanced inventory. Um, and just giving vendors all the tools um, to be successful and some like, you know, tips and tricks um, for like, you know, taking good product pictures. And um, one of my main tips is always like, give the customer exactly what it says on <laughs> online. Because um, if you're giving someone something like underweight or it's labeled differently, like they're going to question it. Um, so yeah, just being like really consistent. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess I, I, Stephanie covered a lot of the uh, basics, the basis that you know that I also experienced and utilized. But um, I think the one other thing I would say, um, my, my pitch to vendors, most of them were pretty actually eager to get on board interestingly, but um, the, the ones who were hesitant, my pitch was that, you know, we're stronger together. The, the online storefront is more appealing and more customers will use it and more customers will enjoy using it if we can all come together to put all of our, or most of our products on there. Um, and, and the more people who buy in and the more vendors who buy in and, and add their inventory, the, the the more sales will get across the board for everybody. And so it's kind of like a team effort. Uh, and I think that they really did respond to that because they see the same mechanics at work at the, on site at the market. Like they know that we all rely on each other for a successful market and same is true for online platform as well. So and that seemed to be very effective for them. And, and the, the incentive of more sales and, a, and a, a, a greater window of time to make sales you know, all, throughout the week basically was also not unappealing to them as well. So. Uh, yeah, but mo everything that Stephanie said, I also totally echo. And what's kind of nice too, talking about like those that are hesitant to joining, uh, approach that I've taken that's worked well is, okay, so maybe you're not ready to dive in, but let's like dip your toes in the water by just showing your top 10 performing products in the store. So then you're still generating revenue and you're generating sales without feeling um, overwhelmed. Uh, with this new online option that's available, because we have to also realize 
a lot of vendors that work with markets, they're just not, they're not always comfortable with this online option. So I always just say, don't be afraid. Let's dip our toes in the water and then we'll see how we go. And most of the time we're seeing those vendors expand their product listings, which is great. Mm -hmm. I'll yeah. just add one more thing really quick that I thought of is um, there's a couple of other um, like e-commerce platforms that I've seen that where the market manager sets up each um, vendor's account. And I would not suggest doing that. Um, mostly because it's so much more work and you're also taking responsibility away from the vendors um, and you, vendors should feel like accountable to their products and their online store. So um, exactly like I love that teamwork message and it definitely um, takes away from it when the vendor doesn't set up their own profile, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and just a, a note to our audience here, I see your questions coming in. We're gonna uh, take a quick second. I'm actually gonna throw it back to Stephanie. Uh, I know that she had an example sort of that initial package that she sent to vendors to get set up. So I, I'd love to check that out to, and have you guys see that. Um, and then we're gonna move into some questions about attracting customers um, and also getting vendors to stick with um, to stick with the platform and to actually manage their inventory and everything. So I see your questions, just letting you know and acknowledging that. But Stephanie, uh, if you can go ahead and share your screen and just kind of show the audience sort of what you send out to your vendors. Totally. Um, and if it's helpful, I can also like send this um, for, for Katie to send out. Um, but yeah, just getting your, can you, you can, can you guys see this? Yep. You can see it. Okay, cool. Um, so really just how it works, um, you know, how do customers order? What's the time frame? Um, when are the pickups? And then just like in 2020, this is how much vendors sold, you know, just to give people a little bit, um, of an idea. And then, um, yeah, the fine print, um, when vendors deliver products or when we pick it up from them, how they get paid, what our service charges. And then I just added like what's new in 2021. So we added advanced inventory. Um, and here's a link to that great page on local line site, how to use that. Um, and then, you know, their drop-off options. We even offered to hold inventory for vendors if they have shelf-stable products. Um, and then just instructions for returning vendors, which was so easy. At the end of the year, I zeroed out all of their inventory. And then in 2021, all they had to do was like add a number. So that was so easy for them, but also linking to the hub supplier user guide. And then for new vendors, just how to you know, how to get paid, the, you know, the hub supplier user guide again, um, how, um, yeah, how they can get started. And then just some tips for success. Um, so, you know, product pictures. Um, and I also suggest to some vendors, like, hey, if you have 50 different kinds of soap, like, consider just choosing 10 um, for the online platform because sometimes it can be like a little bit overwhelming I um, mean it's not like a physical market where you can see all the soap and you're like wow there's so many flavors this is awesome but um, sometimes limiting it to your best sellers can work better for online sales um, and then um, yeah just staying true to product pictures and descriptions it'll keep your customers coming back Definitely make sure your products are delivered fresh and no underweight products. And then one like really big tip for vendors is um, if you unexpectedly run out of a product or something goes wrong, um, just like make it right with the customer, offer them something else, something extra, um, just to, you know, keep them you know, having confidence in your, in your product and also like wanting to order again. And I'm sure like other market managers have gone through this a lot. You know, it's kind of different from other um, physical sales of the market. If you give something, someone wrong, or 
you know, a vendor's missing one thing, um, it throws your whole order off. <laughs> um, so just going back to that, um, you know, make it right with the customer, give them something extra, give them something different, and then something extra just to definitely keep them coming back. Um, and then just my contact information, you know, any questions about, um, I like to really specifically always tell our vendors, like, if you're looking for this thing, email this person. If you're looking for this thing, email this person. So if, like, they're going to email our bookkeeper for payments. They're going to email, you know, me for anything else. Um, and I feel like just laying it out clear, like, there's definitely some vendors who I'm sure have never read this, um, but I feel like it's just really important um, to have it down in writing um, so people can try to reference something before they come to you with a question. Um, so if it's helpful, I can definitely, I'm so happy to share this. Yeah, that would be amazing if, if, if you're good with that, Stephanie. And uh, I know that Jen would be thrilled to <laughs> love it. Uh, for people to have that. Yeah, yeah, definitely send this. Yeah, so I'll, I'll actually include that in the follow-up email to this webinar. So don't worry, you will be getting access to that. Uh, so last question kind of on uh, online platform adoption with, with vendors. Uh, question here, we find attracting produce vendors to stick with the platform. Uh, we find trouble, I think trouble att attracting produce vendors to stick with the platform because they're struggling with managing inventory. How can I help them with that? Uh, I might throw this one over to Jen first. Yeah, for sure. So sometimes we'll see this as like, these are sometimes those individuals that are a li little hesitant. Um, so they might need a little bit more handholding. The upside is on our hub platform, you can actually manage the products. So I'm just gonna share my screen. I'm just gonna show the back end here. Give me one second. You see my screen okay? So this is our hub platform. So this is a very, when it comes to the market managers, this allows um, your customers to do a single payment directly to the market. Uh, and this is also where you can manage the uh, product. So if you're on a hub platform, if you click on my store, you'll notice that there's all the list of the suppliers in my demo account. So these are all of your vendors that are part of your market. And you can see that you can view the products. You can also edit the profiles. There's a lot more flexibility as the market manager on the hub platform. If you want to just go in and manage those individual supplier products, you can click on manage products and you can just see the entire list here. Um, but then again, you could look even just by the supplier, for example, so let's say Friendly Farm, they're just having a, like a hard time maybe like updating their inventory. You can go in and you can manage their inventory. You can go in and edit the individual products itself. So for example, if I wanted to add an image or maybe if there was a simple typo, you could update that information uh, directly in the hub platform. So I know with market managers and Reza, maybe like you have some experience with this, but you don't have this ability to manage the products in the market platform, but that is also just a different approach um, in terms of like what the market's direction is in terms of supporting um, the vendors. So maybe Reza, if you want to speak to what you do as the market side of things, because I know our hub platform does it really easy, but curious to see what you, what you do. Uh, Jen, it's interesting that you mentioned this. It's kind of funny. I was going to mention this before beforehand. I didn't think it would come up, but we actually we actually use the hub platform. Uh, our oh, market. you do? I thought you were yeah. on the market platform. <laughs> See, the hub platform is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for for many reasons, but partially what you're describing. And yes, I mean the interface for the hub platform is really fantastic, and it does allow me to. I mean, and granted, I should. I mean, you clarified this, but vendors still do have control over their inventory. 100%. 100%. But it does allow the market manager to get in there in the back end. If, if, if anything needs to get tied up quickly or if the vendor is having trouble. Uh, so that, that added flexibility does help. And, and um, uh, I think that each market has to figure out what configuration and setup is, is, the right, is right for them. But we have really enjoyed the, the hub platform. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily, I know Katie asked a question early on that I don't want to go too far afield from that question, but um, as far as helping produce vendors, 
I, I think what I would say is the same principles apply as what we've been talking about before. Uh, I would encourage your vendors, your growers, not to put more up than they've got and maybe to focus in on their five or 10 best sellers if, if there's a fear that keeping up with inventory might be a struggle because it's always so in, much in flux throughout the season. Um, be focusing on what's good and, and don't put more out than you think you can reasonably have for, for pickup. For sure. And I definitely, we definitely try to take the approach as Stephanie said, where it's like the vendors should be responsible for the products. And we try to like, let them independently take care of things. But when, when things happen last minute, the market manager can easily step in with the hub platform. Uh, so it's really cool to see that you're both um, doing, doing the similar, a similar approach. Reza, I have a question um, for you. Um, do you close down your site um, or do you use lead time? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> we use lead time. I think we're going to do the same thing again this year. We, we launched in May, so I'm still figuring out the little finer, final details. But yeah, I think we, we use lead time. And only one time, like only one time ever, a customer placed an order um, like... It was sort of silly. They placed an order for 2021 last year, uh, accidentally. But that, that was the only ever. That was the only time we ever had an order that came in that wasn't for the most uh, recent upcoming market. So um, we don't use lead time. Um, we shut down our store. Um, we turn our store off um, Thursday at 8 p.m. And this is kind of getting back to um, your question about farmer and farmers and inventory. Um, we had just, when we started our platform, um, we heard from our farmers that they could not possibly, um, you know, in most cases really predict, um, like they basically couldn't add, have inventory over the weekend um, because they couldn't predict how much they were going to sell at the physical market after like online orders were closed for the week. Um, and they didn't know in certain seasons, especially what would, um, you know, be ready for the next week. Um, so while, you know, of course our vendors who, um, sell salsa and sauces and stuff that they always have, um, really would prefer us to always be, have the store open and just use lead time. Um, we decided to kind of side with our farmers, um, and close the store down. Um, mostly because people are order fruits and veggies are the most thing ordered on our platform. So we just recognize that, you know, if farmers chose to turn off their inventory during that time anyway, we probably wouldn't have enough sales to make it worth it. Or someone would order on a Sunday and then on Monday they would see all these other things pop up in the store and they feel like they were missing out. So um, I don't know how many markets do that, um, but we did decide that we would be, you know, open from Monday at 8 a.m. to Thursday at 8 p.m. That's when you can order. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Um, <laughs> to help answer that question, it's actually split. So uh, between like using lead time and closing the stores, a lot of it is um, based on resources um, as well. Not just about the vendors managing their products, but it's also resources available from the market. Like, do you have somebody there that can help manage orders over the weekend? And if the answer is no, then it's likely that they're going to close the store. Um, and then if they want to have a permanent open store and rely on lead time, one of our new features of showcasing out of stock products is like a really good enhancement that we released where if a product does go out of stock, it will still show in the storefront, but it's just not available to be ordered at that time. So we're definitely seeing a big split between lead time or like closing the store. Interesting. Yeah. And for us, like we just can't use that new feature because some vendors have just listed so many products for their whole season that I'm like, it would be all sold out products, but I could definitely see that feature being really, really useful for a smaller, a smaller market. Yeah. It's yeah, it's definitely being, it's definitely being utilized, but it's not. And again, like 
I always think of local line as like, we're giving you the Lego blocks to build what you need. And some features work great for some and some don't work. So it's just nice to have the flexibility. And I'm glad you're both doing things differently, but using the similar platform. It's really cool to see. Yeah, that's really cool. I, uh, I hate to move us along. We do have a couple more questions. This is all good stuff. Um, but just to go back to the hub versus market platform, great question here. Uh, twofold. So one, uh, a question here, can you just change from market to hub or would you have to start from scratch? I'm sure it's a simple answer there, Jen. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so it sometimes it's as easy as flipping a switch uh, and sometimes it's it's not. So I, I would probably review what platform, like you're on the market platform and where you're at in terms of setup. And then it's it, we can 100% migrate you to the hub platform. Uh, there are some conversations that need to happen because uh, the hub platform is more than just managing the products. The hub platform is also you being responsible for taking payments from your customers and managing your delivery and pickup locations. So I know sometimes there are some guidelines where markets cannot actually take the money from the vendors, nor do they have the resources uh, to be able to pay the vendors uh, strictly through their team, especially like some teams that are very volunteer based. So yes, we can 100% transition from one platform to another, but there's a lot of other discussions that we would love to have. So we'd be happy to have that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And then the follow up here is what is the customer feedback been between hub platform and market platform? We, we haven't done both. We've only ever done a hub, but we did do a survey after sort of like Stephanie mentioned also, uh, we did a survey with our online customers after last season and many of our customers indicated that they they really did appreciate the single checkout. And so we've never done the market platform. So I, I don't know how, I think that, you know, in a sense, it's all about training your customers. I think they would get used to it. I don't think it's necessarily as foreboding as they might think it is, but they, they like being able to just check out once for all the vendors at the, at the market with all the products that they wanted versus with the market platform, I, I believe that the customer can put all their selections in one cart, but they do multiple checkouts for each vendor, you know, X number of checkouts for X number of vendors that they have bought from that time. I would just echo um, what Jen said, you know, if you're a smaller farmer's market organization, you're, you're volunteer based, you don't necessarily have a bookkeeper um, to, to work out the back end on paying vendors, um, the market, I could totally see the, you know, the market, um, model working in that instance. Um, for us, I know it would be really limiting. Um, I feel like when customers see they have to check out and pay, um, you know, multiple times, maybe they would order less. That would be my, um, I don't know. That would be what I would think maybe as a customer. Um, so I feel like the ability to check out once um, in the hub model is, is just better for us. Um, but we do, we are big enough where we do have like that backend support. Right. And I don't want to, I don't want to reinvent the wheel by just repeating what Stephanie just said, but I, I would say that for us, the reason we decided to go with the hub model is because we we have we have a pretty robust infrastructure. We're a small market, but we have a, a very robust infrastructure back of back end back of house to for reimbursement of vendors. We basically build in repayments from online sales into our repayments for things like SNAP, because uh, we have a whole bunch of we have a whole fleet of food access programs. And so since we already had the infrastructure in place to cut checks every two weeks, we just build in the payments from online into that and it was pretty easy. Uh, but I think doing that, we also did it because we have, I would say a, a very high level of, uh, our vendors have a very high level of trust in the organization. I mean, they, they know there is no question, they'll get their money, they'll get it on time. They, they really believe in us, they believe in what we do. We've had these vendors, many of them for many years. So there's just a lot of goodwill amongst them. I think if you're a new market or if you like, like if like Stephanie said, if you don't have the infrastructure back of house, I wouldn't 
take that on just to do the hub model. I think the market model would probably be more in line with that, that market's needs. And I would also really quick highly suggest um, moving towards ACH direct deposit um, instead of cutting checks. We're saving a ton of money doing it. Um, it's one thing we put in place during COVID and we'll never go back to cutting physical checks. Um, we will absolutely never go back. So I know it can be a challenge to get um, vendors on board sometimes for that, but it has completely just taken so much time. Um, just, it's given us back so much time um, doing ACH. So would definitely recommend. And just and FYI be for our Canadian uh, members in the audience, this is specifically, yeah. Uh, an American program, so uh, just hold Sorry. on one sec. We're shifting after this, <laughs> but just FYI, okay. if you're not, if you don't know what that acronym is, it's not for you anyway. <laughs> Do you guys have any any direct deposit? Uh, they do. I think it's we, just we have a okay. Yeah, it's yeah. a different model in Canada. It's gotcha. uh, it's Sorry, uh, discretionary <laughs> income. Discretionary. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thanks for the tip. I I, I wrote it down. Okay. <laughs> and Jen, sorry, you had something there. Uh, just for like the market side of things. So I know we've been talking a little bit more about the hub side of things, but uh, if you're on the market platform and for onboarding market vendors specifically uh, on the market platform, when we, when I do some onboarding calls or those vendor workshops, like I talk them through like how to set up their payments. So they understand the payments come to them directly. So sometimes the vendors also have a peace of mind of like knowing that like they're, the money's coming directly from the customer to them. They're responsible for that transaction. So it's a lot more hands-on approach from the vendor to the customer. Uh, and part of it is also just working with the market manager and explaining like what the vendor is responsible for and what the market is responsible for. And I do a good job of explaining that through, depending if they're in the hub platform or the market platform. In terms of like customer experience when it comes to the market, when, and Reza kind of touched on this before, like when you don't know what is the other option, you don't know what it's like. So we don't actually have a lot of like negative feedback about customers doing the multiple checkout because they feel like when they would shop in person, they're handing money to those individual people, which is those individual transactions. We're just taking that approach and moving it online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I just want to shift in the last couple of minutes that we have. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, getting your customers at the market uh, to adopt this digital platform, to, to adopt, you know, uh, buying ahead of time online and picking up at the market. Uh, one of the good questions that we had up here is how do you, how do you just deal with that line of people waiting to get into the market? How do you cut down on that line? Uh, signage, even in particular, passive and fun wording to welcome all but encourage people to maybe order ahead of time for the sake of, of safety right now with COVID-19. So uh, kind of an open-ended question, but I'd love to get everyone's thoughts. Um, so we do a lot, um, maybe this isn't answering like the signage question, we do a lot of social media, um, just like promotion of our online market. Um, so like I just did um, like a live um, Facebook screen share demo of like how to shop online because for, you know, some customers that's not intuitive. Um, we, I can share um, just like, you know, little kind of videos here. Let me just share really quick if it's helpful. Um, like this one we just, did. Um, so, you know, just letting people know there's a line shop online, you know, um, just like a different um, way to shop kind of like what I was talking about before. Um, and at the physical market, um, we have been um, having our volunteer who's counting all the customers in have them, you know, hand out flyers, a physical flyer. Um, I'll share that too, just because I'm 
so this is, um, you know, our QR code um, and, you know, people can scan that with their phone and see the online store. Um, so this is just also a really good way to diffuse a situation um, where if someone's like, I've been standing in line for an hour and I'm mad about it. You're like, hey, did you know we have an online platform? Skip the line next time. Like, so it's been really nice. Our volunteers love it um, and they are able to you know, give the customer something physical to diffuse the situation, but also spread the word at the same time. Um, we also have an information booth at the market and we um, give these out at the information booth. Um, also, we have, a, when we have a line at the market, we have barricades that sit, have like a sign on them that say, you know, 15 minutes estimated wait time, 30 minutes estimated wait time. Um, and I clip these on to every barricade um, just to, you know, hope that some people see them as well. And they're like, oh, cool. I could do this next time if I don't want to stand in line. Yeah, that's, those are some great ideas there. I, I love that. Uh, we just had a comment. Uh, I think some of us would be thrilled to have a line at our market. So I'm going to take that as uh, an indication to throw a question out there. How are you all attracting customers to your market right now? Are you leaving up to individual vendors, for instance, or what are some of the efforts that you're putting forward to uh, just get people into the market online or in person? Um, well, we, um, we, I mean, we do a lot of social media, um, uh, you know, posts, um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, we have a really big online following. Um, we do, you know, paid posting on there. Um, and we definitely like in the last two years have kind of pivoted that to be, um, you know, sharing like rules, um, and like, you know, guidelines for shape, safe shopping, you know, wear a mask, keep your distance. Um, and we haven't really, I mean, right now we're having a problem we've never had before, which is like, we have too many customers. Um, so definitely trying to, um, right now push, um, the, push the online market, um, instead of pushing, like coming to the physical market. Um, but I don't know, maybe someone else has more insight about how to attract more customers to the market right now. Um, I know just like on the FMC, um, I've been on a couple of calls there and um, the WSFMA, which is the Washington State Farmers Market Association, um, they are like all about um, pushing the idea that farmers markets are essential um, and also that it's way safer to shop outside and support local than at your grocery store. Um, I would definitely say focusing on those messaging um, messages if you're having trouble attracting customers right now to your online market or your physical market, um, you know, definitely promoting that, um, you know, it's outside and you're supporting local um, businesses that might be struggling right now is definitely like some good messaging. Yeah, I mean, I would I would add on to that. I think I don't want to take it in a direction that's too far away from the real focus, which is e-commerce. But um, things that we're doing to attract more customers that, you know, in addition to what Stephanie mentioned, um, our market, we, we partner with the local tourism agency, Destination Gettysburg, and uh, and they help get the word out about us. And they have their own cool little apps. They have a new a new thing called the crop hop. So we're a stop on the crop hop. Um, so novel things, but primarily partnering with the tourism agency in your area is usually a good way because farmers markets are becoming a, should be a destination in your area, like a, especially when things are a little safer and tourism is picking up again. Um, one other thing that we're doing this year that's new, and it does sort of relate to local line in a certain way, is we are, launching a kind of direct text SMS marketing uh, system, kind of like a, a digital newsletter, but just through text instead of email. And, you know, one thing, one, we haven't really launched it fully yet because our season hasn't started. But one thing I would like to see happen with this is to text our customers, uh, hey, the, the, the 
a local line storefront is open uh, you know on monday uh so like or, or, or it's close you know if it's thursday and we're closing at 8 at 8 p.m then maybe get a text at 5 p.m like make sure you get your order in before the store closes uh so using text in that way to get people to shop online it's novel we, we're, we're still getting our feet wet with it but i think it could be very promising yeah absolutely any tips from you jen yeah, so I'm, I take the approach of uh, like if you're just trying to get new customers and maybe you don't have those massive lineups, like keep it simple. Uh, like consistency is key when it comes to your messaging, whether that be online or just through your direct community. Uh, leaning on your vendors uh, to advertise on social media consistently and not just advertise like them and their storefront, but that they're a vendor of your market. And it really just shows that like, the partnership and that community aspect and um yeah like honestly that's like the biggest thing is getting your vendors on board to to share as well so part of the onboarding that i do too is we talk about like where is the market listed on a website is it part of if it's part of a city then where is that easily accessible for customers and vendors to be able to share that information uh, we also are starting some really, really awesome resources through our marketing team. Katie knows what I'm talking about, which talks about like, you know, it's essentially plug and play uh, social media templates for like Facebook and Instagram. So we're going to have a lot of these resources we've already started, but that's the direction that I think that we're going to. My number one is consistency will be key in getting those vendors on board and sharing that common message. Absolutely. And uh, just to let everyone know, you will be getting as part of your follow-up email, you'll be getting exclusive access to our first plug and play social media guide. So for Instagram, um, you'll be getting advanced access to that. Very exciting stuff. So, <laughs> so this is like following up really quick right. on what Jen said. Sorry. Um, we also, I forgot to mention that we also like, please ask our vendors to promote themselves being at our physical market and online. And we do um, a social media training at, at our vendor orientation every Great year. Idea. Vendors, yeah, vendors find that really, really helpful. That's a great idea. Yeah, I love that. So at this point, I'd love to get some concluding thoughts uh, from our panel about uh, making that shift to online, anything that stood out to you today or any any concrete tips you want to give to our vendors and managers on uh, the webinar today. So I'll uh, I'll start with, let's see, Stephanie, if you want to go first and then we'll hop over to Reza and Jen. Sure. Um, I would just say um, that having the online store for us has really opened up um, some new opportunities and possibilities. Um, like I said, with last year being, you know, the safest way to shop and this year being, you know, just a different way to shop um, for convenience um, if you're short on time. But I just like to end with saying that um, for all the, you know, market managers um, and vendors out there, it's been a really, really hard um, last season and this season. And I feel you and I'm right there with you um, and all the rules and regulations and changes that you've had to make. Um, they're really, they've been hard um, and it's been really hard um, on, you know, farmers markets managers and vendors across the country, across Canada and the US. Um, so just know that, um, yeah, we're all like right there with you. And I think that I'm just happy to have been able to share some um, insight that I'm hoping will help someone out there. So that's all. I, I think I would, I mean, clearly I would definitely uh, uh, concur with what Stephanie said. I think she said it very nicely and that's all very true. I, I think that one other thing, I would say two things. The first thing I would say is that in addition to everything that Stephanie said, it has been, you know, this has been very challenging for a lot of people, but a lot of industries, but especially agriculture, especially farmers markets um, everywhere. But what one sort of positive side effect or silver lining you might say to the situation, I think is that there, at least in Pennsylvania, at least on the, on the East coast, there's been a, a really big surge in demand for local um, food, especially in the height of the pandemic. Um, 
And I'm, I'm hopeful, and I think the signs are pointing to the fact that this is true, that that surge in demand will become, in some ways, a new status quo. I hope that people have now got a taste of local food. They wanted it when, when things were scarce and grocery stores were running out. Uh, and now, you know, I hope that that will just continue and that will be the new sort of trend that will just see a bigger and bigger boom in demand for stuff that's produced locally and, and sustainably. Um, so we'll keep our fingers crossed for that. And uh, I think that that's what we're going to see, I hope. And, and, and platforms like Local Line just make it e even more accessible. Um, the other thing I would say about Local Line in particular, one thing that wasn't really touched on during the webinar is that, you know, Local Line is a business. Ostensibly, they are an independent organization. They are independent from any farmer's market that they work with. They're, they're not the same as the Adams County Farmer's Market. They're not the same as the Vancouver Farmer's Market. They are their own thing. But our vendor, my vendors, the vendors at our farmer's market, you know, they understand that Local Line is, the, is its own business, but they really think about Local Line as an extension of our market. Uh, anything that Local Line does and, and how they feel those interactions go are a reflection more on our market than on Local Line itself and from the perspective of our vendors. And so that is why I really appreciated actually uh, working with Local Line and why I feel like I'm sort of a Local Line loyalist. You know, some people are Coke people, some people are Pepsi people. I'm a Local Line person. And it's because our vendors have glowing things to say when, when the tech support team work with our vendors or when they, when they have troubleshoot an issue or just the interface at all or the resources that they get, uh, our vendors have really responded very positively to how Local Line has interacted with them uh, as opposed to what you might consider an alternative being, you know, maybe a bunch of auto dialers or auto responders or, or bot text or, or unhelpful interfaces, you know. So I, anyway, all I mean to say is that Local Line, as far as the perception of being an extension of our market, has been very positive and I've, I've really appreciated that. We love to hear it, Reza. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'm almost blushing, like just knowing that I do so much of the success and the support. Um, I love hearing that stuff. And that's what I think of when like my concluding thoughts would be local line is a partner of the markets. We're really just trying to help you support, support your community and get good local food to your customers. And it's so great to see that our support that we can provide to you, whether it's resources or your vendor support, or even your individual customer support is helping you get um, to essentially help these markets survive. Uh, we don't ever want to see the markets go away in person. We just want to support uh, those in-person shopping, but then supplement it with online just to make sure that we're getting the most, um, the most sales like through your community and making sure that it's easily accessible. Yep, exactly. We're here to support you and to help you succeed. So with that, uh, thank you so much for coming to our presentation today. And thank you so much to all of our panelists, uh, Reza, Jen, and Stephanie. Incredible insights. I think everyone has a lot of takeaways from today. If you want more information or want to talk to us about setting up an online presence in an online store, feel free to contact us at info at localline.ca. Uh, you'll probably reach at some point, you'll talk to Jen. <laughs> so feel free to, uh, to hit us up. Uh, and also just let you know, we have more webinars coming up in May. So the next one, we're going to be looking at some pretty cool topics, uh, potentially about uh, grant writing and, and acquiring grants in agriculture. So that'll be a really cool one. Uh, in the meantime, feel free to check out some of our success stories on our YouTube page. We are posting uh, just some incredible stories of farmers that have not only used local line, but really just to highlight uh, the success of local agriculture, how COVID has really challenged consumers to think about how they shop, what they eat, and where their food comes from. So definitely check that out. It's on our IGTV and on our YouTube page. Look out for a follow-up email. We'll have all the resources that we talked about today. So again, thanks for being here, and we look forward to the next one. Thanks, y'all. Take Thank care. Thank you.